You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. So last time we ended with verse 8 in First uh, John 5, right? Uh, and we had we had seen that with him uh, speaking of the water and the blood and uh, and all that that his point in there was uh, the threefold witness to his son right the spirit the water the blood these are trustworthy John was showing the the three witnesses all agree and they are not just the testimony of men but of God himself okay so now in verses nine and twelve. John is going to continue to work with the theme of witness there. So let's just look at 9 and 12 real fast here. In 1 John 5. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning a son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in a son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. All right. So if we receive the testimony of men, he says, the testimony of God is greater Okay, so it's a general statement. It's referring simply to human testimony in general. But I think there's a better interpretation that relates to the context here overall. And this can be an illusion of uh, the witness of John the Baptist. If you remember, John the Baptist at the baptism of Jesus. Uh, And this is the opponents, the uh, false teachers were quoting to support their claim that Jesus came by water. At his baptism. So in the fourth gospel of John, Jesus refers to the, the, um, to the Baptist testimony as human testimony and indicates that it's much less important than God's testimony. God's testimony trumps it, right? So when Jesus was baptized, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that was the testimony of God concerning his son. So Uh, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself, he says in verse 10. Uh, Whoever does not has made him a liar uh, because he had not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So when you believe that that testimony about Christ, and we've seen this in 5.1, it's because God has given you life, right? He has given you life. You believe this. You were dead in your sins. Now you're alive to God in Christ. You've become a new creature or new creation in him. So when you believe, you have this inner witness in yourself. And the principal role of the Holy Spirit is to testify of things concerning Jesus the Christ. So those who reject God's witness about Jesus reject God because he says here it makes God a liar. Those who reject the testimony of God show then that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, is not in them, okay? Such people are not accepting uh, true testimony concerning Jesus. So John here, he's got the false teachers in mind. As far as he's concerned, they're the ones who don't believe God's testimony concerning his Son, all right? They, They deny that Jesus is the Christ, come in the flesh, They deny that he came by water and blood. And by doing so, John states then they have made God uh, out to be a liar. All right. So this is the first uh, the fifth time in the letter that uh, John is actually accuses his opponents of being either liars or making God out to be a liar. 
So in, in 11, he says, and then th this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. All right. That that God gave us eternal life is this. It speaks of this past completed act. And the, the letter began began with this. It began with the testimony that the eternal life has been revealed in, in, in chapter one, two. So this life is in his son and God's son. OK, it's ex that's exclusive of the gospel of Jesus. There's no salvation in any other. We know this. It's just Christ and Christ alone. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you might be saved at all. Right. It's just Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the father but by me. So God's witness is, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him, believe him, listen to him, all right? So whoever has the son has life, who, and whoever doesn't does not have life. So it, this seems, it's pretty simplistic right there. <laughs> if you don't have the son, you don't have life, right? It tells us that not everybody is in Christ. Not everybody has Jesus, right? So, you, you know, do you believe the testimony that God has given about his son, about Jesus? If so, you have eternal life. If not, you, do, you don't have it and you will uh, continue to perish in eternal death. All right. So that brings us to 13. Uh, and this is the conclusion of this letter. Uh, and we've seen the main theme is fellowship with God. Uh, among other things as well, and at core at that fellowship is love. It, you're going to notice in a repeat of several themes that have been developed here throughout the throughout this entire letter, and uh, and and he he will list th these things that believers know. And when he goes on in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. All right, so. Uh, many see that, that I write these things. I write these things. That's the reference to the enti entire letter there. Um, that's how a lot of people would refer to that part, that phrase. But as we said earlier, John's purpose is to instruct his readers on how to have fellowship with Jesus and the Father. So it's better to see the phrase, these things, as referring to only what John had just, just got done saying about the witness, about God's witness uh, in 6 through 12. So the, the believers to whom John wrote had been shaken by these false teachers. They'd been shaken by the, these antichrists who denied all these important elements of the message that the readers had uh, embraced at the beginning, right? So the reader's assurance had been shaken by these denials or by these claims. So John writes to bolster their, their assurance by counteracting the false teaching of these false teachers, right? So with that statement, then he, he's giving assurance to them. He's, he's saying, hey, you, you, have, you have eternal life. Don't be questioning what they have put into your head. You know? Don't let that get to you. So he, it's an assurance of salvation. John's telling us that all who believe in the name of, son of, uh, of the Son of God have eternal life. You believe God's witness and the testimony, you have eternal life. To believe in the name then means uh, it's the same as believing in the person who bears the name. To believe in the name of the Son of God is accepting the revelation given by God through Scripture of who Jesus is. And it involves believing that Jesus, fully man, fully God, came to redeem the world, right? 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So John's already brought up this whole idea of having confidence, in prayer and in, 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 in other things as well. And this, this promise of answered prayer if we are obedient to God. Now John's speaking about confidence that believers have in the presence of God. All right, Confidence in this context refers to your confidence, the Christian's confidence in the presence of God in prayer. 
All right, so you notice the last part of 14. If we ask anything according to his, his will, he will hear us. Now, th this doesn't mean he only hears our prayers when they are according to his will. We know he, hear, he knows everything. He hears everything, all right? But uh, have, you ever, have you received everything you've ever asked for in prayer? I, I haven't. <laughs> right. See, if we ask anything according to his will, though, it says, right? According to his will. We don't, well, okay, yeah. So when, when the Bible talks about God's will, it, it's, it can be referring to one of two things. God's sovereign will or his providence. Uh, providence is his predetermined plan for everything that happens in, in the universe or his moral, or his moral will. That which is revealed in the Bible and it tells us how to live, okay? So we don't pray a God, uh, or we don't pray according to God's sovereign will because we don't know what that is until it comes to pass. So it must be telling us that we need to pray according to his moral will. So since God has revealed his moral will to us in the Bible, uh, then you have to, then how can we pray according to his will if we're ignorant of his word? So again, always goes back to his word, studying his word, knowing his word, knowing your doctrine, knowing your theology. It's by the word of God that his will is revealed to us. So it's by that his word then and the Holy Spirit applying it and enlightening and opening the word that his will is revealed to us. So as we read and we study the Bible, we learn what God's moral will is, and as we do, we should pray according to what is revealed. You're still not always going to know what that is, I don't think, when you're praying under certain circumstances. You may not, you may just be at a loss for it at that moment, um, and so you pray according to your will. Just, I don't know what it is, Lord. You pray according to your will, have mercy in the situation, um, for your will to be done, all right? So, uh, you know, and there's a lot of debate on that, but this is the way I, that's the way I've, <laughs> I've taken it to the last couple of years now. Uh, let's see. Verse 16. If anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death. All right. There is sin that leads to death. I'm not, I'm not saying he should pray about that. John starts to amplify this theme of prayer now by applying these general statements um, to a particular need of prayer for Christians who are in who have fallen into a sin. Okay, so prayer prayer for a sinning Christian is this concrete demonstration of love for that person. Uh, we are to help those in the Christian community who fall into sin. We've been over this before, too. We should address this. We should uh, actually talk to these people about those things if we see them in this, in this and, and help them, right? So he says, if anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin, okay, so the if, it's a potential action. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, all right? And so uh, also it says, if you see them committing this would uh, indicate that the sin is observable, all right? So it's not the same as them having something on the inside of them, an internal attitude. So it's a public or a visible sin. <clears throat> and, and it is a sin that doesn't lead to death, he says, all right? Much confusion on that phrase. Uh, he's drawing a distinction between sins that don't lead to death and sins that do lead to death. That's so like, okay, what is this? <laughs> what, are, what are these sins, right? What is this? Well... He says in our text, he mentions will give life to him. Uh, will give as future verb. This would lead me to believe that the, the life that is given to the believer is a physical life because he already has eternal life in Christ. Right? Um, are you confused yet on that? So we're going to come back to this in a moment. But first we'll look at what John means by the sin that leads to death. Okay? Okay. Um, Apparently, John's, John's reader knows what this is because he doesn't give explanation, okay? John's readers knew what it was. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. It, it, unfortunately, it, to us, it's unclear. We don't have time to cover all of the thought, thoughts surrounding this particular phrase. There's uh, an abundant amount of them. 
But if we understand the sin leading to death is referring to spiritual death, then it seems clear that the author could not have envisioned Christians then committing such a sin, right? Because in 516, it's instructed to pray for the fellow member of the Christian community who commits sin not leading to death. So many interpreters assume that a member of the Christian community could not commit this sin, but John doesn't say that. So within the framework of John's thought, we do know that believe, all believers possess eternal life, and while unbelievers uh, remain in darkness, all right, which is spiritual death. Okay, So the sin leading to death is a sin committed not by believers, but by unbelievers. And the sin unto death here is the denial of saving truth through the incarnation of Jesus and the salvation that he has procured. And this tie, still ties back into where this witness thing, the, the threefold witness and God's witness and all that. Um, so why does John say God will give life to him, to those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death, right? If believers already have life, why do they need God to give them life for a sin they committed? Well, I think that John is saying that believers that commit certain sins could die physically from them. And this is why we are to, to pray for them. And what John says is very sim similar to what James says in James 5 Verses 19 and 20, it says, My brothers and sisters, if any uh, among you strays from the truth and someone turns, uh, turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So I, I think that this is what John is talking about when he says God will give life to him, to those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death. That believers can't commit the sin that leads to death, which refers to eternal death or spiritual death. And, and, but again, I want you to know, I said, I think, okay, there's many takes on this, and I think that's what it is. I'm not, um, but again, I'm trying to keep it in context. And like I said, there's many people who say many, many, many things on this, and it's, it, you could spend, we could spend several <laughs> several days talking about it probably. But I believe that's what he's getting at. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. Verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin that doesn't lead to death. Okay? So John restates and reinforces the distinction he made in 16 between sins that do and do not lead to death. And having implied that sins committed by believers, okay, those, are, those don't lead to death, they may be prayed for and forgiven. John does, doesn't want to leave the impression that such sin is insignificant. So in all this, you, let's remember John's point. We should be praying for believers who have fallen into sin, okay? Verse 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. So re he's repeating uh, chapter 3, verse 9 here. So we have to, this, there's this question then. It's being, what is being said here, right? Because we all sin. We know this, right? But he just, he says, everyone who's been born of God does not sin, <laughs> right? So what what's what's, what's what's why why does he talk like this right? Uh, some people will take it very very li literally. You don't sin. Um, we know we do, right? Um, so it, it's not it's not a. We have to pragmatically ask what's what's going on, and it, it's it's not only a problem pragmatically, but it's a problem doctrinally, obviously, because it doesn't fit with the primary rule of hermeneutics, right? Because Scripture teaches that we sin. Uh, uh, it, it teaches that believers will still sin as well. It continually calls believers to stop sinning. So what John wrote earlier seems to contradict what he's writing here. Obviously, that's an issue, but we know God's Word doesn't contradict itself. So if we... We know in 1 John 1, 8, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
So here he says, if we say we have no sin, we're de we deceive ourselves. But in verse 18, he's saying everyone who has been born of God doesn't sin, right? <laughs> so which is it, right? Well, we, we've been over it. We've been over it and over it. And we come down to that it's either some specific sin or a, a habitual sin, right? And then in the last part of the verse, we see that Christ keeping believers eternally safe. So I think the last phrase in the verse confirms this, that and the evil one does not touch him, he says. The evil one cannot touch believers because Christ is guarding them, all right? Is it the one who is born of, of God uh, keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. It boggles my mind how many people just ignore the word of God all the time and say, think the devil's after them. The, the devil's trying to do this and that and all these things and cause this, this havoc in their life. And right here it just says the evil one does not touch him. He has no power over you whatsoever. He can't do anything. <laughs> it just, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Verse 19. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's pretty simplistic. However, I'll point out that that in the power of the evil one does not necessarily mean that the devil controls the world because he doesn't, all right? You also know my view and what I believe about the devil and him being destroyed. Uh, but that did not eliminate sin. It does not eliminate uh, uh, people being sinners. And that, that's the point that John is getting at. We are of God, but the rest of the world is lost and in darkness and in sin, Okay. That's the whole point of that. Instead of trying to turn it into some big thing about the power of the evil one that controls all these things, God's in control. God's sovereign. God's in control of everything, not the evil one. It's sin, all right? It's sinners, unbelievers, those who are spiritually dead. The world is in darkness. Verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and has, has given us uh, understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and, and eternal life. Okay, so we have a reference to the incarnation and the understanding, uh, which Jesus uh, gives is, is knowledge of God, and uh, God of God the Father. To know Jesus, then, is, is true, which means it's genuine. So to be in him, is not only to abide in him uh, who is true, but it's, it's also to be in his son, Jesus the Christ. He is the true God, he says, and eternal life. It's one of the strongest direct statements uh, of the deity of Christ in the New Testament. And um, in light of, uh, of all John's attack against the false teachers who denied Christ's deity, it would seem fitting that at the end of the book to refer to Christ as the only true God and eternal life. And finally, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's an interesting uh, sentence. It's an interesting use of the word and an interesting way to end <laughs> the, the letter, I believe. Um, uh, I thought it was, I felt like it was a strange way for him to end it, but it fits, it fits in with the theme of a real living relationship with God. Um, and, and studying it made, made me, uh, I learned a little bit. Uh, it says, the enemy to fellowship with God is idolatry, okay? And idolatry is embracing a false god or a false, a false ideal of the true God. So John rightly closes with this warning after having spent much of the book warning us against the dangers of of um, of the false jesus that many were teaching in his day right idolatry in context here is thinking something about god that is untrue of him all right it's a different so I, when we think of idolatry we normally don't think of that at least i i didn't all right, so I'll say it. idolatry in the context here is simply thinking something about God that is untrue of him. So it, it's postulating anything about God that is not right. All right, so in its fullest stage, it is creating a God. 
all right, creating a God that's not real. And its secondary stage, it is making the God, making the God who is uh, in, in, into something that he is not at all. And, and many, many of us have been guilty, not purposely, uh, when we're tra- studying and first trying to learn about God, many of us will do, th- do or think things about God, uh, and, and we could be guilty of that. Now, it's not on purpose. <laughs> like I said, it's not purposely. But, um, you know, a perfect example of what I'm just trying to say here would be like, well, you know, uh, a loving God that wouldn't do blah, 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 blah. And, you know, so my God, you hear people say my God is like this. My Bible says, <laughs> you know, people like to use that. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but my Bible says this. Okay. It's like it's the same Bible. We have different theologies here, people. But that would be the simplest uh, definition of what I'm getting at here, okay? And maybe, maybe in its third level, you know, it's, it, it, like I said, it's thinking thoughts about God that are untrue of him. And it may not always be on, it's not purposely, okay? But it's undoubtedly brought to his mind, to John's mind, the, the false false god of the false teachers of his day they denied the god of the bible they said that the christ came upon the man jesus at his baptism and left him prior to his crucifixion and they did not believe that he is eternal god in human flesh so john is telling his readers that if they have a substandard view an understanding of jesus the Son of God, then that is idolatry. So anything that is short of Jesus the Christ that's revealed as God God, by God through his word is idolatry. He's warning them once more to avoid these false teachers, these opponents of the church with their heretical false teachings, just as he's done over and over again throughout this letter. So he caps this off with the highest statement. Jesus is the true God. But if Jesus meditates true knowledge of God and is so intimately related to God that he himself can be called true God, then any doctrine or any worship that dilutes those affirmations then is idolatry. So the warning, little children, keep yourselves from idols, points to the danger of worshiping any God other than the one that's been revealed through Christ. All right? Now, the idols here are not pagan deities. That's what we think of when we think of idols, right? That, that's the thing. They are not pagan deities. They are not images of stone and they are not of, uh, of wood. But they, the idols here, the idol pictured here is a picture of a, is a false picture of Christ. That causes one to stumble, causes one to fall away from a relationship with the true God. And that's what it is there. Okay, false religion. And that concludes that letter. Any questions, comments, disagreements?